Fantasy TV. So somebody writes me and says, but Martin, in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, Paul tells the Corinthians, flee prostitution, flee prostitution. You said that Paul would not resort to the law. You said that Paul doesn't give any direct commands. Yeah, but this is like telling somebody to run out of a house that's on fire. You don't take time to explain the mechanics behind it, to explain how you go about doing that. Flee immorality. It's like run out of the house or flee prostitution. Get out of the house now. Why? Uh, the house is on fire. Run. That's like saying run. That's like saying run. It was an emergency situation. You tell somebody to run, you don't say, but you can't run unless God causes you to run. I know that. Or you don't tell them, but you know, um, you if you try to directly tell yourself to run, we're back into the law of Moses. Uh, it's the same as saying, thou shalt run out of the burning building. Thou shalt run. What are you taking people back to law? No, it's an emergency thing. Paul explains the only way you can behave yourself in Romans 6. It doesn't mean it doesn't apply when he gives other commands more more directly, it just means he sets the table. He explains the principle. In Romans chapter 6, he is explaining the principle that you can't frontal attack these things. You have to do it by tending to Christ. But uh, every once in a while, you got to leave the burning building. So get out of the burning building. Flee prostitution. It doesn't mean that it doesn't apply there. It just means he's not mentioning it there. But it was a good question. It was a good statement. This is Martin Zender starting a new week of uh, broadcast excellence here, um, <clears throat> unpacking the scriptures, making the complex simple. That's what I like to do. I have to make it simple for myself before I can explain it to you in a simple way. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. Uh, <clears throat> yes, actually, it is a problem many times, but... Now, I told you that when Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, now you be putting away all these anger, fury, malice, calumny, obscenity. He says, put, that's a direct command, be putting away. He's telling them, put them away. But again, it's based on Romans 6. You can't put it away by give, giving yourself laws and directives, and especially not attaching thou shalt not to them do not thou shalt not attach thou shalt not to your directives your personal directives you must look to christ that principle is in place and i told you though it's helpful here because it says be putting away all these be putting away and i told you on friday this is was a technical issue in the greek it's in the middle voice this is a beautiful thing the concordant version brings this out it's like what in the world is a middle voice of the verb the middle voice well it's a lovely thing it's a beautiful thing. It's kind of sexy to me. The middle voice is, as far as verbs go, see, you're not doing something directly yourself. The active voice would be, I grabbed that apple. The passive voice would be, uh, what, the apple? the apple was grabbed by me, I suppose. The middle voice is somewhere in between. So in the active voice, you're acting upon a thing. In the passive voice, the thing is acting upon you. Follow that. Active voice. In English, we have only two voices. Why is it called voice? I don't know. I missed that class in English, but I know that's what it's called. We only have two, active and passive. What I'm telling you is anything on the active side as far as you depending on yourself, as far as God is sitting back telling you to do something, and now it's up to you, it's going to end in failure. Only God can do these things, but we don't sit around waiting for God to do them. We assume he's doing them through us. See the difference between the absolute and, and the relative again. And whenever we fail, we don't beat ourselves up over the failure. That's what I've been telling you. We are looking to God and to Christ all the time. So the active voice is you're doing something. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. That's active. This is not the active voice. Put away these things. What? Anger, malice, calumny, obscenity. Talked about that Friday. Putting on the young. Putting on the young. What does that mean, putting on the young? It means put on, cover yourself in the new humanity. This is Colossians 3, amazing passage. Verse 10, put on the young, which is being renewed into recognition. I told you that this whole thing with Paul was about recognizing this truth. 
that it's God operating in you to will and to work for the sake of his delight. And that the only way we can live with the things that we do that are unsavory is to put on the young, which is being renewed. It's a newborn baby, this young creation, the new creation. The old has been crucified with Christ, as I've been telling you, in accord with the image of the one who creates it. Look at this. It's so good. Verse 10, starting in verse 9. Yes, yeah, stripping off, middle voice, put away, middle voice, putting on, middle voice, the young, which is being renewed. Your new humanity is being renewed every day into recognition. I told you, you just have to realize this is true. You just have to realize that this is true. You can't feel it, this wonderful opinion God has of you now. You're righteous. Uh, you can't screw up in his eyes. You have to grow into a recognition of this fact. And that's where the middle voice comes in. The middle voice comes into a realization that something is true. It's not that you actively go get it. It's not that you just sit there and do nothing. You come to realize. You come to understand. And your understanding changes you. How you believe changes you. The example I give all the time is if somebody deposits a million dollars in your in your bank account if you don't know about it if nobody tells you that it's in there you don't look at your account you don't check your balance then you'll you'll think one way you'll think that you're poor you'll think that you you're, you're barely making it but then somebody tells you that it's in there and you say why did anybody tell me this is growing into recognition of the young because the money was just put there it's young it's a new thing it's a new thing somebody did something for you and now I'm telling you about it, and it changes your whole freaking life. The money's been in there. It's been there. The blessings of Christ that were won for you when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it's been there for 2,000 years. Your salvation has been there for 2,000 years, but nobody told you about it. Instead, you went to a church, and they told you that you had to earn it. They told you that you had to say the sinner's prayer. They told you that you had to believe in Jesus, and you better do it now. You better hurry up. Yes, that was an emergency situation too, but they never explained to you that the only way you could do that was if God inspired it. Oh, by the way, that objection that says, that, that guy told me that Paul says flee prostitution, that's a direct thing. Yeah, but he just he didn't say in that context that you can't do it unless you look to Christ and unless you appreciate the new humanity. You can't do it by way of the law of Moses or any kind of thing like that. I could say that about Acts chapter 16 too. Yeah, you remember the Philippian jailer. After Paul and Silas are beaten in Philippi, they're put in the interior jail, and then the earthquake comes, and they're broken loose, and the jailer is worried everybody's going to escape. He starts to kill himself because he's the one held re responsible. Paul says, don't. They go into his house. They explain the evangel to the guy. Because the guy was impressed that God would send this earthquake to deliver his servants. Very nice, very nice. Thank you for the earthquake. But the point there is that Paul says, believe. The guy says, the Philippian jailer masters, says to Paul and Silas, what must I be doing to be being saved? Paul says, believe. Just believe and you shall be being saved. Martin, there's proof. There's proof that Paul's telling somebody to believe. They must be able to do it. Now, now, now. Because he's already explained in other places, like Romans 12, 3, he already explained uh, that uh, God parts to each the measure of faith, that is, belief. God parts, it's up to God to give it. He already said in Philippians 1, 29, that it's graciously granted you to believe. He already said in Ephesians 2, uh, 7, 8, 9, that um, by grace through faith are you saved through faith, and this is not out of you. The faith is not out of you. And so somebody could say to me, well, look at Roma. How can you say that? Acts chapter 16, Paul's telling the Philippian jailer to believe. So everything you're teaching, Martin Zender, on this must be false. Uh, no, Scripture doesn't contradict itself. It's just that in that situation, he's not mentioning the backstory. That's it. He's just not mentioning the backstory. If I tell you to run out of a, bur a burning building, run. But Ma, and you said that we're not supposed to give commandments to ourselves. Yeah, well, if you're in a burning building, that's a good time for it. I can't explain the details right now. I can't go into the middle voice right now and, t and tell you that 
you know, it, it's God that's working this out in you and you're to put on the new humanity. You're to consider the old humanity to be. No, by the time I do that, you're burnt to a crisp in aisle F, okay? So get the hell out of the building. I'll explain the details later. So Paul does in Corinthians, flee prostitution. I'll give you the details later, but, you know, these guys are hanging around the front of the building. Like, ooh, look at that one. Look at that one. Ooh, these are the cult prostitutes in Corinth who are bringing men into worship of false deities by means of sexual intercourse. Wow, that's a powerful cocktail. Everybody wants to be religious. Everybody wants to do something for some kind of higher power. Combine that with sex. Oh, my God. No wonder they were all lined up at the temples in Corinth. That is the cult prostitutes. All right. So it's the middle voice in Colossians 3. Put on. Okay. I said there's the act in the English, there's active and passive, but the Greek has this beautiful nuance. It's called the middle. It's not like you do it, you take it, you do it, you believe, you do this without any other thing, without any other influence. It's not passive either where you just sit there and go, well, I'm just going to wait for God to tell me what to do. Or the Philippian jailer, I'm just going to, I'm supposed to believe? Okay, well, I'm just going to see here because I know I can't believe unless God acts upon me. Well, that's true. But sitting there is the passive voice. Well, Martin, how do you thread the needle between doing something active, take it, take the bull by the horns, and just sitting there and like let the horns of the bull take you? This is how the Greek, the Greeks, those Greeks, those toga wearing freaks, they have another voice. Oh, yes, they do. This is why God did not reveal himself in English. We don't have this beautiful, fine-tuned, delicious middle ground where it's not that you don't do nothing, but it's not that you initiate it either. And for example of that, I am going to go to Ephesians. That's right, you heard me. Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. In verse 10 of Ephesians uh, chapter 6, Paul says, For the rest, brethren mine, be invigorated in the Lord and in the might of his strength, put on the armor of God to enable you to stand up to the stratagems of the adversary, for it is not ours to wrestle with blood and flesh, but with the sovereignties, authorities, world mights of this darkness, spiritual with spiritual forces among the celestials. When Paul says put on the armor of God, it's in the middle voice. Put on the armor of God. Now, I've seen Christian graphics, Christian cartoons that show um, the armor of God being put on. And the wearer, the wearer has all these armor, has this armor. Like the Christian is sitting there, the Christian is standing there, all victorious with a sword, with a breastplate, with a helmet, as if the Christian takes the armor of God. God says, I got some armor for you here. Christian takes it actively. Active voice takes it, puts it on themselves. And like, here I am, I'm a soldier. You've seen these pictures. You've seen these illustrations. Christians love this stuff. Yeah. The soldiers of God, onward Christian soldier, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. No, 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 that's not how it is at all. You're not wearing it yourself. That's the active voice put on. That's not the active voice. It's not the passive voice either where you just sit there and do nothing. Now, I had, to ex I had to figure out a way to explain this. I had to figure out a way to demonstrate it. In the late 90s, I think it was 1997, I came up with an illustration to demonstrate the middle voice. I'm going to show you how I did it. It was in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. I used to go up there a couple times, uh, maybe four times a year to teach in Kitchener, Ontario. This was in the late 90s, maybe mid to late 90s. And I said, put on, this is the middle voice. I'm telling you this because I want you to take it back to, to, to Colossians and see how Paul says to put off these things. How do you do it? Put off, put off. Is it an active command? Sounds like it, but it's in the middle voice. So this is what I did. I thought about this for a few days and I said, I got it. I got the demonstration. So there I am at the conference in Kitchener. I brought my lovely wife, Marsha, there with me. And she was equipped with an umbrella. That's right. And we were indoors, ladies and gentlemen. The umbrella was not for the purpose of shielding ourselves from rain, but for the purpose of demonstrating the middle voice. Here's how I did it. 
I introduced my talk. I went to the armor of God. I said, it sounds like we're supposed to put this stuff on ourselves. And then each of us has a breastplate. Each of us has a helmet. Each of us has the sandals of peace. Uh, no. And I said, Marsha, please. Marsha, please. Come on up here to the front, Marsha. Let's give her a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Marsha, wonderful. Here she comes. Here she comes with a red umbrella. I said, I'm going to. I said, this is what I said. I said, what I'm about to do. Uh, is something I would not recommend you trying at home. I'm a trained professional. Don't try this at home. You could get hurt if you don't know what you're doing. I'm going to demonstrate the middle voice of the Greek with a red umbrella. Everybody's like, oh, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. This was a Barnum and Bailey circus act to them. They were stunned. People were riveted in their seats. Here came Marsha. I said, Marsha, please extend the umbrella. And she, like, the drum roll. She extended the umbrella. Now, I was standing here. She was uh, three feet to my right. I said, now this, if this were in the act of voice, put on the armor of God, this is what it would be. The audience is dead silent. They can't take their eyes off us. They're slack-jawed. They're witnessing history. So I reached over, took the umbrella from my wife, put it over my own head, took it, put on, take it, put on act of voice. I said, this was what you would do with the armor of God if it were the act of voice. It's not. That is incorrect, ladies and gentlemen. Don't let me ever see you grabbing an umbrella, putting it over your own head, and think that you're exercising the middle voice. Stunned silence. So I took the umbrella, gave it back to my wife. Then I said, I'm now going to, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to introduce to you, show you the passive voice. Drum roll, please. Drum roll. And then with the passive voice, I stood there, didn't do anything. And my wife came over. Of course, we had planned all this. I brought her up to speed on this, told her how we were going to do this. She walks over to me with the umbrella and puts it over my head. I don't do nothing. I just stand there. I said, did you see what just happened, my friends, here in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada? Did you see what happened? That was the passive voice. I just stand there and do nothing. But this is not the passive voice. Okay, Marsha, please. Three feet to the right now. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before... A live audience for the first time in history. I'm going to demonstrate the middle voice with a red umbrella. May I have a drum roll, please? And as the drum was rolling, I, Martin Zender, took one giant leap for mankind. It was one small step for me, but it was a giant leap for the illustration of the middle voice with a red umbrella. So I came on i went under it you see marcia didn't move i went under the red umbrella i came under the influence it's not my armor it's god's armor it's not mine i come under the influence of it so i'm doing something but i'm not building the thing i'm coming to a realization of that was the analogy and i'm coming under its influence coming under its influence i'm not taking it putting on the armor my armor oh no that's the christian fantasy it's not the passive where I just, oh, Martin just says you were supposed to do nothing like we're a bunch of uh, fatalists and we just sit there. No, I'm telling you, come to a realization of the truth. You think on these things. You're, you're brought to the truth and then you understand it. Bing, the light bulb goes off. So that was illustrated, the middle voice. I do something, but it's still not mine. It's still not mine. I, and it's, again, coming to a realization. So I stepped over to the right, came under the umbrella, and it, it was like, you know, fireworks on the 4th of July. It's like, oh, people were, they took their breath away. They took, it took their breath away. I had popcorn salesmen and peanut salesmen going through. They had never seen it. The mood was celebratory. After that, I, w I was feted. Um, there was confetti in the air. People slapped my back. They had never seen anything like it. They wondered why Paul had never thought of doing something like this, say, at Mars Hill. I said, I don't know. This was left for me to do. I thank God that he left some work to do yet, and that is demonstrating the middle voice of the Greek with the red umbrella. So taking that back to Colossians chapter 3, it's a matter of coming to a realization of the truth. As Paul says uh, in the verse I just read, a recognition of the young. Yes, in the same passage, a recognition of the young. So you do something, but you're not actively doing it. You're coming to a realization of what Christ has already done.